Hello everyone and welcome to another video by Liminal Spaces. Today I'm going to do a deep reading on the novel that I read and just recently reviewed for the channel and that is Deus I Ray by Philip K. Dick and Roger Zelazny. So this is actually the second time I'm recording this deep read. Uh, I actually had it, I recorded it right after I did the review last week but I went and edited it, and as I was editing it, I realized that it was kind of disorganized and not as succinct as I wanted it to be. Uh, and I even, as I was editing it, started having new realizations about the plot that I really, really wanted to cover. So uh, I'm taking another crack at this. Uh, we'll see how this one goes. I think it'll be a lot more organized. I really love doing these deep reads because for me it's a chance to really dive into these novels. And I know that they're not as watched as the reviews, uh, but I also know that they're watched kind of more exclusively by our subscribers. So I appreciate that. Uh, and thank you guys very much for, for taking the time to watch this channel. Okay. So I am going to make a couple of assumptions as I'm uh, making this video. The first assumption that I'm going to make is that you have watched the review. Uh, the review of the book goes pretty deeply into the ground situation of this novel. So I'm going to expect that you've watched that and really quickly um, jump across the ground situation of where this book opens. Uh, so if you want a more in-depth uh, idea of that and you haven't watched the a uh, quick review of this novel, pop back a, a video and watch the review uh, of this novel. I'm also going to assume that you've read the book, although that is doesn't have to be the case. If you want to watch this without reading it, you can. Uh, but just so you know, I'm going to spoil the plot all the way to the end. I have to in order to to give my interpretation and my, my deep reading of it. So uh, do expect that this is 100% plot spoiler uh, all the way through. Um, and when we come up to the big quit twist that this novel does have, I will tell you uh, that it's coming up so that you know that the, the, at least the big twist is about to be spoiled. So in order to do this analysis, I'm breaking the, the book into five parts and those will run chronologically and the first part uh, I want to look at is, um, I'm going to call Charlottesville, Utah, because that's where it takes place. So, part one, Charlottesville, Utah. So, going to go over the ground situation really quick. I already covered it in the other video, but a few years after, or right after 82, we can't really tell exactly when, soon after 82. Uh, the world is destroyed, the surface is completely irradiated, uh, and the man that is most responsible for this is Carlton Luftefell. I don't know if I said that name right, um, but we'll be calling him Carlton throughout the rest of this so that I don't have to slaughter that uh, last name uh, every time I try to say it. Um, so he was the one that triggered and I think helped, in, helped invent the the final weapon that really irradiated the surface of the planet. And basically a lot of creatures have kind of become sentient and have mutated due to the radiation on the surface. And humanity is breaking up, broken up into little towns. Uh, they're starting to try and reform society, but uh, there's not communication between towns. So each little town is kind of an isolated little place. Also, a uh, new religion has formed and Christianity has fallen out of favor, although there are still Christians. The new religion uh, worships this Carlton that uh, was, the, was responsible for the weapon that really irradiated the surface. And they worship him as the God of Wrath, that he is a man that has also embodies the God of Wrath. 
And the reason that this religion is formed is because after the terrible events of the apocalypse, people were no longer able to accept a God like the Christian God, like God and Jesus Christ, because they preached kindness and uh, forgiveness and all of these things. But the people that went through the apocalypse and were born after the apocalypse, that God made no sense to them. Because when they looked around, the world was a destructive, ugly, wrathful place. So this religion, which they call servants of wrath or sowers, uh, was created to explain the new world, right? New world needs a new religion. Uh, and the old religion is falling off. It's not completely gone. There are Christians that still exist in this world. Uh, but the servants of wrath outnumber the Christians by a ton. And... I, the way I kind of thought about it as I was reading it is it's kind of like the idea when uh, somebody with, with faith experiences a loss, they can have a, a question of faith because of that, right? Because the, the pain is so much that they can't fathom that a kind and just God would do that. So the whole world has gone through this process, but... but really I think what is important, just to restate, is that the new world has completely different rules, social rules to it because of the destruction of the planet, because of all the mutations that have occurred. And a, a new world, a change that strong in social mores and society in general requires a new religion. And, and this is where the servants of wrath stepped in. Okay, so that is the basic ground situation of the story. When the novel opens up, that is the background that we have. And that is slowly revealed to us through the first couple of chapters. Uh, before I move on to getting into the nuts and bolts of this first part of the book, I just wanted to take a second to look at post-apocalyptic literature in general. Uh, specifically post-apocalyptic literature from America. Uh, I know that there is way more post-apocalyptic literature out there that I haven't read, uh, and I am hoping that a lot of you will throw out recommendations in the comments because I do love reading this type of literature. Uh, but I just there's a couple of novels that I absolutely have to mention, and I'm I'm going to mention them in regards to the fact that this story, Deus Ire takes place in a small town called Charlottesville, Utah. And this is in southern Utah. Most of the pilgrimage is, is up through Utah, um, and it ends when they make it into Idaho. We'll get into that later. But it's very interesting to me that this novel takes place in the southwestern United States. And while I was reading it, I was thinking about the fact that I feel like... I feel like many... American post-apocalyptic novels take place in the southwestern United States. So I had to start, you know, going through my bookshelves, trying to, to find the post-apocalyptic books that I've read and just check this out. One of them was Canticle for Leibowitz by Walter M. Miller Jr. This is an incredible read. I read this in the 90s. And I absolutely loved it. Again, it uh, deals with religion, which is also interesting. Uh, but I, I checked. I couldn't remember exactly, uh, so I had to look it up. But yes, this takes place in the southwestern United States. Uh, and it also deals with religion, so it has a lot in common with this uh, Deus I Ray novel. The other one that we have to talk about, of course, and this one's down here because it's so tall it will <laughs> show up in the camera, is The Stand by Stephen King. This is a first edition, later print. I wish it was a first edition, first print, uh, but it is uh, an incredible shape, and you can see the, the text of this block is huge. And this is probably, in my opinion, the most famous of all American post-apocalyptic literature. It's, I mean, you, you talk about 
this is going to be number one on most people's list of post-apocalyptic uh, literature. And it also takes place in the American Southwest. And that just got me thinking, uh, mainly because I live in the American Southwest and I grew up in the American Southwest. And it, it made me start to wonder what it is about this area that draws people so much to the concept of post-apocalyptic thought. Uh, and it got me to thinking about running around on, on the mesa and the desert as a, as a child and a, a young man and the sand and the plant life that is fighting to survive with uh, the all the brown colors, the muted colors and the, the spines on the plants and all of it seems to breathe this concept of surviving in an almost unsurvivable area. And I think that's what calls people to place their stories about the ap apocalypse in this area because the view of it really lends itself to that. I mean, just driving down a desert highway, you can you get a sense that you're kind of already there in the apocalypse. You really do. Uh, so I found that interesting. Okay. Like I said, this uh, first part takes place in Charlottesville, Utah, a small town uh, that has a large sowers population. Those are the servants of wrath and a very tiny struggling Christian community. And... The book opens with a man named Tiber McMasters, who is what is called an ink, which means incomplete. Uh, Tiber does not have any arms and legs. And he's working on a mural for the Sowers Church. Uh, there's, he's painting a, a beautiful mural for the church. And it's interesting because he is renowned as the greatest artist in the area. Um, but he doesn't have any arms and legs he survives in this, or lives in this cart that is a mix of, uh, it kind of seems like almost pre-apocalyptic science and post-apocalyptic science. The cart is, is described as kind of wooden sides and regular trailer wheels, but it also has this battery that seems to last forever and a, a bunch of bionic arms that he uses as his own limbs so that he can live lead a lifestyle that is self-sufficient so he's got this incredible cart and he paints with these bionic arms and uh, he's considered the best painter around so he's painting this mural for the church and they've come to a point where he needs to paint the face of Carlton uh, the God of Wrath, and they don't, they have a, a little picture of him, but you can barely see Carlton in this picture, and they give it to Tiber, and he says, this is not enough, I cannot paint uh, this person's image with just that tiny little, little picture. So the leader of the church realizes that he's going to have to send Tiber on a pilgrimage. He's going to have to go out into the various kind of wastelands outside of the cities and try and find the actual Carlton, the God of Wrath, take a picture of him so that he can include him in this mural. And this is a terrible prospect to all the higher-ups of the church, uh, but it's, it's kind of what they have to do. And it's also a terrible prospect to Tiber. He's not too excited about it either. Next, we meet a character named Loreen, who does not play a huge part in this novel, except for at this very beginning. Um, and Loreen is somebody that Tiber is obviously very much attracted to. Uh, but so is the head of the church, who's married, also obviously attracted to Loreen. And Loreen is not a very well-developed character, which can happen a lot in Dick novels. Um, his character development isn't always incredible we'll say. Uh, sometimes it really is, but it's not always incredible. And, and Lorene is, is put into this book as a symbol of envy of all the men in the town, right? Everybody is attracted to Lorene, and Tiber is included in that. And it's mentioned that Lorene is a servant of wrath, 
but she's sleeping with a Christian, and the Christian's name is Pete Sands, and he becomes very important. In fact, the novel switches to his point of view uh, for the next couple of chapters, and I think through Pete, we learn the philosophical theme that runs through this book. So Pete is a Christian, and Pete has a hobby, we'll say, of searching for and finding old chemical warfare weapons that were used uh, before the apocalypse in the in the war they were used to confuse or terrify enemies and he collects all these chemicals and mixes them together and fine-tunes them in order to have spiritual revelations. He's like a shaman or a seer. And I really liked that concept that, that again, we're seeing a new world, right? The post-apocalyptic world changes all the rules. So we have a new world. Um, we have a new religion, the servants of wrath, and we have a, a new kind of the rebirth of this, the idea of a shaman. Now, of course, Pete is a Christian. So he is connecting these hallucinogens or these hallucinations to specifically Christian visions. And he says some of them bring joy and some of them bring terror. And he specifically has tries to focus on the ones that give him terror. And he says, uh, he doesn't know if it's pure, his Puritan upbringing uh, or if that made him kind of a masochist, but he wants to go a little bit into, and it says not too far, just a little bit into the hallucinations that bring him terror because he feels like they are truer than the hallucinations that bring him joy. I want to read a quote from the book here that kind of explains what Pete is hoping to achieve with the dosing of himself. So, as I said before, Pete is sleeping with Loreen, and Loreen has asked him to stop doing these drugs. She's worried about him. Um, she, he says that he wants to... He's using them to have a specific religious experience, and she says, you know, find another way to measure the existence of God. Don't do it with these drugs. Uh, so she's asked him to stop, and this is his response. But he didn't want to, because he was seeking something, not just diddling himself, but searching. The goal was there, but obscured by a membrane, and he strove, via the medication, to lift the membrane, the curtain, this is how he depicted it to himself. A rationalization, perhaps, but why else do this? Because often he did suffer fear and disorientation, sometimes depression, and even, but rarely, murderous polymorphic rage. So he is taking a toll on him doing these drugs, but he, he goes on, uh, he goes a little bit further in explaining to Loreen exactly what his purpose is and he he's come up with this idea that of course like everybody else he can't imagine that the christian god was allow uh, around to allow the apocalypse to occur it doesn't seem kind and forgiving for him so he has to in his mind figure out where god has gone and he hearkens back to the concept of the uh, Garden of Eden. And he talks about the fact that he feels like at some point, and he doesn't get specific, he doesn't say Garden of Eden, all the, uh, except for in kind of a pro proliferary statement, but he says at some point, either man messed up and broke a taboo, or God felt like man broke a taboo, but either way, there was like a fight and a separation between God and humanity. That suddenly they were no, no longer able to find each other because of this separation. And Pete feels like he's trying to meet God 
halfway through these hallucinations that God is looking for man and Pete wants to look for God as well and hopefully meet him halfway. I love this idea because, number one, we're in a world that has lost societal structure like we know it today. Uh, so Pete is on a religious journey and I really respect that. I don't, I, I believe him when he says he's not just doing this for fun to get off um, because he also chooses the more terrifying paths of the hallucinations than the joyous paths. He is truly trying to do something. He also goes on a little bit about the history of why he started doing this uh, and he talks about a moment when he was with Lorene and the he was trying out new concoctions of the drugs and he had got angry and threw stuff all over the apartment and then eventually started um, beating Lorene or trying to. She's dodging out of the way and and tr kind of staying away. And in this moment of rage, he, he feels the sting of God. And he describes the sting as this overpowering feeling. And basically he says he feels a spear stab him in the side, of course, referencing uh, Jesus on the cross being stabbed, if I remember correctly, with the spear to, to put him out of his misery. He feels this stab in the side of his his chest, I mean, in the side of his uh, body, and feels the barb shoot all the way through him, and it's the most exquisite pain he has ever felt. And he can see the spear that is piercing his side, and he follows it up, all the way up to the heavens, and there he sees the Trinity and they're all looking down at him and telling him that, that they have to do this to wake him up. And so he awakens to this truth that he needs to find God, right, through the taking of these drugs. Um, and after that, there's no more instances of him trying to physically uh, abuse Loreen. I don't know if he was specifically saying something about abuse there. Uh, he probably was, uh, but it seems that the book is more focused on him starting this religious journey because of that than the stopping of abuse. So, um, yeah, you'll have to make what you will of, of that. So that describes Pete, but it also describes the philosophical under, underpinnings of this novel. Right, this novel's interested in the creation of and the experience of religion. One other thing that I do want to say is that um, Philip K. Dick had visions himself throughout his life. Um, the the there's a couple of really big ones, and one of the earliest ones that I've read about is him seeing an image that he called God in the clouds looking down upon him. And he describes him as having no eyes, but these mechanical slits built into his face. Uh, everybody that uh, watches a lot about Dick and reads a lot about Dick will recognize that as Palmer Eldritch. Um, and he wrote right after this, The Three Stigmata of Palmer Eldritch. This was in the early, early 60s that he had this vision. And later, he has a vision of a woman that's wearing a fish necklace that a light bounces off. And he writes Vallis because of that. But we're going back to an earlier vision that made him write The Three Stigmata of Palmer Eldritch. Here's the first edition of that book. It's a BCE. It's a book club. It's not the, the first first but it is published around the exact same time and has the exact same look as the first edition. I bring this up, I bring up this book because Dick dealt with that vision of God, that, that mechanical slit-eyed version of terrifying, he said it was terrifying face that he saw in the clouds uh, of God in the Three Stigmata of Palmer Eldritch and his main theme for this book, and I did do a deep read of this book if you look back in the channel, his main theme of this book 
was what it would mean to man if they met a life form that was way more advanced evolutionarily than they were. Would they worship it as a god? And uh, um, Dick has an incredibly complex answer to that question that you can find out about in my deep reading. Uh, but it's interesting to me that this this novel is dealing with the uh, Deus Ire is dealing with the exact same vision. In fact, in chapter three, this what I've been talking about a lot of this is in chapter three, uh, we see his vision of God and he describes it exactly like the vision that got him to write Palmer Eldritch, uh, Eldritch. So I think this book is Dick tackling that concept uh, again, not the same concept, I'm sorry, ta tackling that vision uh, again through a different theme, both religious themes, but through a different way of coming about it. Uh, I think he had a lot to unpack with that vision that he had. But this one comes from a different angle that I'll, I'll, I'll get into as we, uh, we keep going. But I really found that interesting uh, that it was the, the same image. I would love to know what book was started first, the Three Stigmata of Palmer Eldritch or Deus I Ray, uh, but there's no way to know that. My gut instinct is that that Eldritch came out first, but but who knows? Deus I Ray could have been started and um, given away before that other novel even started. I don't know. It would be really interesting to uh, to find that out if. If anybody has any information on that from interviews or, or whatever, I could not find any of that information. So if you know when Deus Ire actually started being written, that would be incredible information. Okay. Oh, I forgot to bring up one more post-apocalyptic novel written uh, uh, in America that I really love, and that is Cormac McCarthy's The Road. Unfortunately, I don't have a copy of this book because I once I finished reading it, I, I gave it away. And the reason I did that is because it is one of the most beautiful, sad books that I've ever read. It tore me apart. I read it a few years after my daughter was born. And um, this relationship with the man walking through the wasteland with his son, so incredible. And I just couldn't, I couldn't take it. It was so beautiful and so good and so sad and so damaging that I knew I, I'd never read it again. Um, I don't think that one takes place in the American Southwest. I don't know where it takes place. Uh, but yeah, I don't want to forget that. That's, of course, an incredibly important post-apocalyptic novel from America. Uh, again, if you guys have post-apocalyptic novels that I haven't mentioned that you love, please put them in the comments. I'd love to read more of this. And not just American. I'd love to read post-apocalyptic uh, literature from all over the world. Um, so yeah, if you know any uh, really good ones that I haven't talked about, please pop it in the comments. So that's what Pete's about. He's also sleeping with Lorene, which gives him a lot of power in this community because everybody's super jealous of him because everybody likes Lorene. Pete and Lorene are hanging out and talking about all these hallucinations and uh, that Pete has had. And he takes drugs at that point and has another vision where he sees Jesus. And... Uh, Dr. Abernathy comes uh, comes over, and he's the head of the Christian church in that area in Charlottesville, Utah. Um, and so they're, all three of them are talking, and then suddenly Tiber comes. And, of course, Tiger is, Tiber is part of the Servants of Wrath, and he shows up and says that he wants to convert to Christianity. And Dr. Abernathy, I think they start calling him Father Abernathy. Father Abernathy turns, doesn't turn him down. He, sa he says, he says that he might, he feels like Tiber might be doing this for the wrong reasons, but that Tiber should come back and talk to him tomorrow. So Tiber leaves, kind of let down, and they talk about the fact that the only reason Tiber's asking to join the Christian church is because he doesn't want to go on this pilgrimage to find Carlton, the god of wrath. Um, Lorene is, is 
both a servant of wrath, but she's sleeping with Pete and she's talking about wanting to convert to Christianity. So she's kind of playing both religions and she leaves. So it's just Father Abernathy and Pete. And Pete starts to tell Father Abernathy about seeing Jesus earlier from, from his hallucinations. And Father Abernathy says, this is blasphemy. You aren't seeing the truth. And tells him to give him all his pills, his whole stash. And Pete has a huge stash of pills and does not want to do this. And he's so afraid to do this that he instead agrees to give up Lorene. And that really shows how invested Pete is to this this cause of his. He... And, and we find out that, of course, Father, uh, Father Abernathy is interested in Lorene. He even at one point asks uh, about her breasts and all this other stuff. And Pete is so intent on his journey to find God that he gives up Lorene. He says, I will give up Lorene if you let me keep my drugs. And Fa Father Abernathy uh, leaves it at that. So Pete keeps his drugs and is no longer with Lorene. And the minute that occurs, Lorene's out of the novel. But it's, a, of course, because we're about to go through a huge change in the novel. Okay, the next morning, Tiber meets Father Abernathy and says, Yeah, I'm interested in joining the Christian church. I really don't want to go on this pilgrimage. They call it a pilg. The pilgrimages are called pilgs. Uh, and Father Abernathy says, you you should go on this and this pilg. And, and Tiber's like, I know, I, I gave my word. And he says, but what you should do is go on the pilg and then just go somewhere, sit, sit out for a couple of days, find a random person, take their picture, come back, paint it on the mural and tell everybody it's Carlton. And this bucks against the morals of Tiber really strongly. And he suddenly doubts the Christian church because of Father Abernathy's immoral suggestion and decides he doesn't want to join the Christian church and that he's going to go on his pilgrimage. And that ends part one of this book. That is the Charlottesville, Utah section. Part two is a short section and we're gonna call it the God of Wrath. So we suddenly jump to an unknown narrator, and at this point in the book, my favorite chapters were the chapters that were told from the point of view of Pete. I really enjoy Pete's quest. I like the seriousness of Pete's quest. I like that he is doing it not just for getting kicks of taking drugs, but he's specifically using it to try and troubleshoot a, a problem he sees between God and man. And when I was younger, I was a little wild, and I enjoyed my fair share of psychedelics. And I like the concept that he puts forward that just because, just because the drugs make you hallucinate in this case, doesn't mean that hallucinations aren't real. Um, and the way that they kind of explain it is that it's just another form of perception. And this was a really popular concept in the 60s that uh, LSD and other hallucinogens would not make you hallucinate, but would tear away the veil of perception, of the forced perception of of real life off your eyes and you could see the reality that lay behind it. And I got into all that kind of stuff when I was younger um, and I really enjoyed it. And it's explained very well by Philip K. Dick. So Pete's chapters were my favorite, but we jump to a new point of view for the next couple of chapters. Uh, and it took a little bit of getting used to, and I'm not going to lie at first. I thought it was Pete but somehow flashed into the future that the, the narrative had jumped into the future. And this is Pete later, but I was wrong and I'm going to spoil it. At first, we don't know who this narrator is through one whole chapter. And then we find out who it is halfway through the next chapter. But um, the unknown narr narrator is Carlton, the human God of wrath, right? And it's just about what he's doing. He's not in Charlottesville, Utah. 
he's out kind of in the wastelands and he's living in this series of bunkers and he also is taking drugs like Pete does which is why I thought it was Pete and he has taken in he found a, a neurodivergent young woman who acts like a child uh, or exists in the consciousness still of a child and thinks of Carlton as her her father and calls him daddy uh, and she plays with toys and the hallway and all this kind of stuff and although from our point of view Carlton seems to not care about her he obviously cares about her because he gets her cars and to play with in the halls and takes care of her and it's 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 really kind of interesting because instantly I felt empathy for this character but we find out later that he's Carlton the guy that created the machine that and launched that radiated the earth and it's important to note that the war was beyond saving he released this type of weapon that's like drones that fly around and radiate everything. So they'll continue to radiate into the future uh, until, I guess, they just die out, run out, entropy. He's not good. He is the god of wrath. He is the evilest thing imaginable in this book. So I like that Dick presented him in such an empathetic way because it makes him an extremely complex character also he's got this huge bump on his head and i first thought that pete had taken so much drugs that his head was expanding but that is not the case um and he falls down at one point and hits this bump and it sends searing pain into his head so he decides he's going to perform surgery on himself and he gets a knife and tells Alice, oh, the young woman's name is Alice, which I think is important and I'll connect to that in a, in a bit. Um, sends her into another room. He gets a knife and he has this huge bump on his head and he cuts and the writing is so descriptive and incredible and he cuts again and he's able to get his hands inside this cut and there's a, a shard of metal in his skull, basically. And he pulls it out and passes out. And Alice comes in and there's blood all over his face. So she picks up one of his shirts off the floor and pats it on his face to get the blood off and pulls it away. And notices that she's basically created a likeness of her father, as she calls him. Uh, on this shirt, which of course makes us think of the Shroud of Turin, more kind of religious imagery. At this point in the book, we still don't know this is Carlton, so we, we don't know what's going on or, or, or who, we deal, who we're dealing with. The next chapter is when we find out that it is Carlton, and he has left Alice at home and is out scavenging and... He goes down into the sewer, and in the sewer, he starts mentally talking to rats. At first, I thought these were just sentient rats, but they're not. They're communicating through the, the mind, and I don't know if this is a godlike power or if this is a mutation from radiation. But he starts having a conversation with these rats. And as they're conversing, they're like, you're the enemy. And they start coming at him, this wave of rats. And he has some kind of flamethrower or some kind of weapon that he annihilates a whole chunk of the wave, this wave of rats. At which point they instantly kind of respect him and they don't want that to happen again. So they start giving him offerings and he's, he says that he wants to eat rat um because he's hungry and they say okay we're gonna find our plumpest um youngest best rats for you and you can eat them so they start giving him rats to eat from their hoard um 
And the way this is written, in my opinion, um, this is just prose, not the story, but the prose at this moment and the way he presented this battle with the rats in the sewer is the best part of the book prose wise. It's incredible. It was so interesting to read and had me so invested. It reminded me of the scene with the arsonist in the stand. And I can't remember his name, uh, but there's a scene where he is free because of the apocalypse. He's free to practice arson and he goes and burns down i think it was a silo i can't remember exactly what the building was uh but it's the part of the stand i'll always remember the most because it was just this character whose insanity was allowed free reign because of the apocalypse and every every individual is their own i don't know the word to use here is their own society after the apocalypse. Uh, and Stephen King's writing at this point is incredible. This is not, The Stand is not my favorite post-apocalyptic book because I have a really hard time with how black and white the religion is in the book. Uh, it just kind of comes down to God and Satan and one's super bad and one's super good. And there's not a lot of gray in the actual religious concepts that the two follow. Uh, whereas in this book, I feel like, in, in Deus Ere, I feel like the religion is super gray. And I, I enjoy that because it seems more like reality to me. However, all the parts that don't involve religion in the stand are incredible. Stephen King is such a good writer and such a good character developer that, that you you know all these characters and reading deeper and deeper into them is just insanely fun. The reason I do is because this moment in Deus Ire is to me the at, on par, on par writing wise with that moment in the stand where the arsonist is burning down the building. Um, if Philip K. Dick, and I do believe this part is written by Philip K. Dick, and I'll talk about that later. If Philip K. Dick had written this novel at that level throughout the entirety of it, this would be up there with some of his best novels. It really would be. This was a level so good, and I think it would be mentioned in the same breath with The Stand uh, every time. Um, I absolutely love this book. I gave it a 9 in the in the rating video. Um, but there are, are parts that don't hold up as well. Like for instance, the three stigmata of Palmer Eldritch, I gave a 10. Uh, this one has a couple of, of issues. And one of the issues is that that, if he could have sustained that peak, it would have been an absolutely incredible 10 out of 10 all the way through the entire book. Okay, we never really get any information or, or any any other point of view from the God of Wrath throughout the rest of this book. On to part three, and we're going to call part three Pilg. So this is when... Uh, Tiber goes on his pilgrimage and the tone really changes in the book from this point on. We have explored the religious aspects that we're going to explore for a while and we're, we're now going to go on a journey that in my mind really is an homage to Alice in Wonderland. And it's interesting to me that Carlton's daughter is also named Alice. I think he's really pointing at this book when he was when he was doing this section of it. Uh, this is exactly what a first edition copy would look like. Uh, however, this is a facsimile of the first edition made in the 40s. I wish it was an actual first, first edition, but yeah, we're talking thousands and thousands of dollars for a first edition of Alice in Wonderland. Um... So yeah, I see a real Alice in Wonderland concept going on here. And of course, Alice in Wonderland is 
about going down a liminal space, the rabbit hole, uh, coming up in in a new world, a wonderland. And this book is about Tiber, who has lived his whole life in Charlottesville, Utah. Uh, and that is his existence. And he leaves Charlottesville through a gate, which we can call a liminal space, and goes out on a pilgrimage into a world that he doesn't understand. It is and a new world for him. So it is, is very much uh, side-by-side uh Alice in Wonderland, it really is. And the people that he meets are reminiscent of Alice in Wonderland, uh, but they're all science fiction versions, post-apocalyptic versions of what that would look like. Uh, the first thing that he meets is a computer AI. So Carlton, the god of wrath, built a computer system that was an AI that was what launched that that final weapon and the ai is still running and it has a limited number of we'll call them blank robots just these these kind of robots and i don't know if they put on a holographic image or what but they look like women um and carlton is taken in by one of these robots and the really cool thing about this is it's based on a story that Philip K. Dick had originally written in 53 called The Great Sea. And this is the great computer. And, and it's about a post-apocalyptic village and an AI that continued to exist. And the AI demands sacrifice once a year. The town has to send one person to go to the computer and it is allowed to a ask the computer three questions and if the computer can't answer any of those questions the human goes free but if the computer can answer all three of the questions then the human goes free um, and no human has ever been able to stump the computer so they're they're always sacrificed and they sa they're sacrificed by being dumped in this vat of acid inside the computer that dissolves them and uses its trace elements to continue to exist so that's exactly what the story with this computer is in this novel as well um and tiber uses a religious question i think it's how did the world come into being and the computer starts explaining the big bang and everything and tiber says no 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 you weren't there so you can't actually say and uh, it becomes a religious question of of how the world was created and Tiber proves that the computer's not answering 100% fact because the computer can't know 100% fact because it's a theory and he's able to get away. But it is interesting because the computer's not conceding that Tiber stumped it. Uh, Tiber says, ha, I stumped you and explains why. And the computer's like, no, I can still explain scientifically what happened. And Tiber, who was given a gun by the head of his church, um, shoots the blank robot. I don't. That's all I can really call it in the head. Uh, and as it falls, killed, he turns and runs away. He's in his cart, of course, so he drives away. I forgot to mention, and I did in the the review video that the cart is pulled by a, an ox, by a cow. So he meets this computer AI. And has to get away from, from that. Outside of Charlottesville, the world is completely different. People are not living as socially integrated as they were in Charlottesville. Um, and he comes upon this hill and the sun is going down. And there is this desiccated apple tree with one shriveled apple that's growing on it. And... As he passes, he suddenly feels something and he turns and looks back and suddenly the apple is no longer wrinkled and shriveled. It's a big, fat, uh, shiny, black apple. And he is terrified but also filled with desire to eat this apple. And this, I believe, is another step in what I was talking about in that a new world needs a new religion. Um, also, a new world 
needs new fairy tales and I can't help. I know this is also a reference to the Garden of Eden. And that, of course, makes sense because earlier Pete was talking about the Garden of Eden was this, the, the place where this misunderstanding between God and humanity happened and they were separated. So obviously this fits the theme, the Christian theme of this novel. Um, but he, Tiber also is afraid to eat the apple because he says it might be poisoned. And when we think of poisoned apples, we can't help but think of Snow White, which is exactly what I did. Uh, I, my studies were in fairy tales and folk, so I, I, I pick up on these references a lot whenever they occur. And I like this idea that fairy tales will also change once the new post-apocalyptic world is created. New fairy tales, because of course fairy tales uh, and folk tales were often served to uh, warn children against certain actions, to uh, preach certain behaviors, and so on and so forth. So of course they're going to have to change to suit the new world. And we have that moment there where we get the dual image of uh, the Garden of Eden and the poisoned apple from Snow White. Really b brilliant, brilliant stuff. Um, he meets tall, sentient lizards that scare him. He thinks that they're going to steal his cart. And so do the readers. Like the, the, the fear is, is both in Tiber and really well uh, directed towards the reader. But it turns out the sentient lizards really... Their, their number one goal is to protect humanity. So they're very excited to meet a human. And they offer to sell Tiber a dog. Uh, Tiber really wants the dog. But before anything can happen with the dog, um, a bunch of bugs come and they're sentient Um mutated bugs they're bigger um and the lizards and the bugs get into a fight again very alice in wonderland and then on top of this he meets runners which i think are kind of small almost balls with legs that run really fast uh, and they tell him that his bearings on his one of his cartwheels are dry and that he's going to lose movement in that tire but they know of an autofac nearby autofacs are factories that the russians during the war would secretly launch and plant into the ground in america so there's this and, and it was just an automated factory um that could also do mechanical work so there's no human involvement in them they're completely automated thus the autofac uh they go there the autofac wants to be spoken of spoken to like it's a god and Tiber refuses to do that, so he eventually just drives off without getting his wheel fixed. So after he leaves the autofac, he is going along the road and the tire seizes up. So he's stuck, just like the runners told him, but the runners are back with the autofac. And he's suddenly attacked by a giant worm but like while the worm is attacking attacking he's talking about how he really doesn't want to attack so he's like this reluctant monster and he's saying i don't want to attack you but you're close to my horde and i got good stuff and all this stuff and tiber is terrified and thinks he's gonna die um the worm calls himself the ur worm and says he cannot die and Tiber realizes he can electrocute him if he just shocks him, that the worm will jump back. So Ty Tiber ends up having to electrocute this worm. And this worm has all this slimy, oily stuff coming off of it. And Tiber gets it all over his hands and a bunch in his mouth. Uh, and before this, there was a bird flying around. And Tiber had been singing and the bird was mimicking his song. Um, but he kills the worm. And suddenly the bird starts talking to him. And Tiber's like, why can I understand your language now? Uh, and the bird says, because you have sipped from the earworm, right? He has taken the earworm oil into his body and that allowed him to communicate with the bird. This kind of stuff is my favorite. I love it because it has a mythic quality. This could, this could be something right out of the Mabinogion, right? This worm literally was hoarding treasure. Uh, and 
Tiber goes and looks at the treasure and it's nothing. It's like bed springs and stuff. Uh, stuff that in Charlottesville would mean nothing, but out here might have some use. It is myth. It is the creation of myth. And this is another thing that I absolutely love about post-apocalyptic literature. And it fits our theme. Myths are retold, right? Legends are created. And we're seeing this creation of this legend as it occurs. And random rules come up. Like you have to sip from the earworm to be able to understand the bird. Uh, it's, it's incredible. It's really fantastical and really fun to read for me. I, I really love so it. So the bird tells him that he knows where Carlton is. That he can take... Tiber to Carlton, uh, and Tiber is very excited about this, although he doesn't know if he can really trust the bird, but he decides he really doesn't have a lot of choice, so he's going to trust the bird, and he follows the bird, and of course his wheel is locked up, so he's just dragging that one wheel, um, and they get right outside of New Brunswick, New Brunswick, Idaho, so they've gone all the way through Utah and are crossing into the Idaho border, and his wheel falls off. And his cart is just stuck. The 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 axle digs into the, the ground there and he can't go any further. And the bird's like, hey, um, write me a message. I think I know a mechanic in town. I'll, uh, I'll go see him and we'll get this sorted out. So he writes a message and gives it to the, the bird and the bird flies off. And suddenly he's stuck, uh, immobile. I really like the fact that Philip K. Dick chose to make a, a an ink, an incomplete, the, the concept of having no arms and legs, a main character in this novel because it, it creates uniqueness that we have to deal with. And because of his cart, he's never seemed at all to be helpless. He's, he's always able to function just as as normally if we if we want to use the word normal uh as anybody else in the society but here we are confronted with the truth of his situation and he even acknowledges it and starts to think about it and slowly he gets scared that this is the end of his journey that he's going to die and the cow is still strapped to the cart and he he starts contemplating whether or not he needs to let the cow go because he doesn't want both him and the cow to die. He wants one of them to be able to survive. Um, so he's contemplating this and he's starting to get scared and he, he dark is falling and he's terrified and the dog shows up. Now I think this was a huge mistake. I wish that, that the dog would have come through him through all that journey with the earworm and all that, but it didn't. Um, but it had been following him, and the uh, the dog um, shows up, and Tiber falls in love with his dog. Dogs are very rare. Um, he's never even seen one before, so he's so happy this dog is here, and he starts thinking, maybe this dog can go and get me food. So the dog is reintroduced, but he is still in this state of of helplessness that is that is making him think that his journey is over and he starts using his bullhorn and calling out and letting people know hey i'm stuck up here if anybody could come up and help me that'd be great um and that doesn't bring anybody and finally he breaks down and prays to the god of wrath um, to help him in this situation uh, that he's afraid of dying. And when he's done praying, he looks around a bit and says, they never come when you call. And at that moment, a light breaks through and this floating face shows up. And this is the kind of end. This is, I mentioned Alice in Wonderland, but it also could have a, a Wizard of Oz feel, right? This is meeting the the great wizard at the end of the Wizard of Oz, um, or maybe the caterpillar in Alice in Wonderland. Anyway, uh, there's this floating head, and it comes screaming at him, and it is the god image of the god of wrath. 
And suddenly we're introduced to a duality. There is Carlton the man that was embodied by the God of Wrath. Here we see that the God of Wrath is a duality. It's a person and a God at the same time. And this floating head is the God without the body. It's the, the God of Wrath, not Carlton, if that makes any sense. Uh, and it comes across as naive for a god. And I'm going to get into why I think that is in just a second. But anyway, the god of wrath is screaming at him. And Carlton right away is like, I'm not Carlton, I'm sorry. Tiber right away is like, I'm so sorry. Uh, I didn't mean to question you. If you knew me thoroughly as a person, you'd know that I've always worshipped you. Da, 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 da. Um, and the god of wrath doesn't care about that. And he says, kneel to me and... And Tiber says, I can't kneel to you. I don't have any arms and legs. And the God of Wrath says, that is in my power. And he lifts up Tiber out of the cart with just, just, he just floats up. And as he lands on the ground, he lands on his knees and he has arms and legs. Um, the fulfillment for Tiber of what he felt has held him back in society for all of his life. This is a huge moment, having these arms and legs. And it's a moment that echoes throughout the, the book. But the God of Wrath tells Tiber that he's afraid of Tiber finding his human body, Carlton, right? And uh, Tiber's like, why would you be afraid of me completing my pilg and finding that uh, your your human essence? And he says, because I, uh, because you'll kill it. You'll kill me, he says. And uh, Tiber's like, why would I kill you? I, I wouldn't kill you. You're the god of wrath. And he says, uh, uh, he's just scared. He doesn't really respond. And then he lifts Tiber back up and drops him back in his cart and his arms and legs are gone. While this is all going down, Tiber takes a picture of the floating head god of wrath to prove himself to prove to himself that it is real, it's not a hallucination, and the picture is a, a perfect picture of the floating head of the God of Wrath. Um, but the God of Wrath says he doesn't like that picture and burns it in his hand. Uh, so he doesn't have that picture in order to use it. But he does prove to himself that that God is really there. And this is a question we have to ask ourselves as readers. There's a couple of ways you can look at this. Uh, the one way you can look at it is that Tiber is hasn't really eaten a munch or had a lot to drink in the last couple of days. He's afraid of dying, and he's probably hallucinating his head off, right? That's one way to look at this. Uh, but the other way to look at it, and the way that I prefer to look at it, is that we can trust him, that he did take a picture of it, and that this is the God of Wrath. And this, for me, is the much more interesting journey through this book, is to accept that this is the God of Wrath, because it brings up so many interesting questions. Number one, this God of Wrath, this floating head, is almost like a bragging child. It's naive. It seems young. And by the plot of the book, it is young. And that's what I love about this so much, is that I believe Dick and Zelazny, and I've been using mainly Dick so far because I believe we're now into the territory that Zelazny was, was writing as well. Um, I believe that Dick and Zelazny are expecting us to take this at face value, that the God of Wrath is there, um, and that he is a young God because man has only created him recently. And I know that's a weird thing to say because usually when we talk about this kind of stuff, uh, there's two sides. God created man is one side, right? And the other side is man created God. And one side believes in the existence of God and one side doesn't believe in the existence of God. But in this case, I think Philip K. Dick and Zelazny are taking a much more complicated look at this and saying man created God and that made God real. Uh, and I know that this is easier to take nowadays. I read the book American Gods quite a few years ago and absolutely loved it. And it's the same concept that humans create gods and then that brings the God into existence. This isn't a special copy at all. It's, I think it might be the first edition cover 
but it is a book club edition. So maybe it is special. I don't know. I didn't expect to bring this up. <laughs> so here's my copy of Neil Gaiman's uh, American Gods, which I think is maybe a first book club edition. I don't know. Anyway. So yeah, we have a young god here that has been created by worship, by worship of man. And it is terrified of the concept of its mortal body dying. Because it is a duality. There is Carlton the man, and there is the god of wrath that lives and inhabits its inside of Carlton. And for me, that's just so much more interesting. The god of wrath tells him that he was the bird. Uh, so the bird was just the god of wrath. Um, and leaves. And unfortunately, Tiber suddenly finds himself in the exact position he was before the god showed up. So nothing's changed. He's stuck outside New Brunswick in a cart that won't roll and uh, with a dog and a cow uh, and is basically staring down the end of his life and the end of his pilgrimage. All right, the next part, uh, we jump to a different part of the, the novel, I feel here. Uh, the next part we'll call Pete. So part four is Pete. This is the reason that I can't give this book a 10 out of 10. The part that we're coming uh, up to here. Uh, we change point of view back to Pete, which I had been waiting for for a long time because I really liked Pete's character. And unfortunately, it's not the same Pete. Uh, for instance, there's no more drug use. Like, the drugs are just completely forgotten. And last time we were with Pete, he gave up Loreen, his m most power he had in town. He gave up Loreen just to be able to keep his drugs, and now the drugs are gone. So Pete has been following Tiber on this pilgrimage. And many of the people that Tiber talked to kept telling him that he was being followed, and he, he knew it was Pete. So Pete thinks he's being sneaky, but Pete's following Tiber, and Tiber knows that Pete's following him. So the first mistake is this is not the same Pete at all. This is not the same Pete at all. All the drugs, all the philosophy and desire of meeting God are gone. This new Pete is has been told by Father Abernathy to follow Tiber, but Father Abernathy kind of hinted at what he wants Pete to do, but didn't really say what he wants Pete to do. So Pete's not sure if he's there to somehow trick Tiber into not meeting the God of Wrath, or if he's supposed to kill Tiber before he meets the God of Wrath, or if he's supposed to help Tiber, like he has no idea. So he's kind of bumbling through all this, trying to figure out what he's supposed to be doing for Tiber. That's the first mistake. The second mistake of this part is we go through the entire Alice in Wonderland journey that Tiber went through again from the perspective of Pete. And that is a little repetitive because we've already seen that. So it, it didn't really feel necessary to me, nor exciting, nor did it bring anything new to the table, except a sense of humor in the prose. And I'm going to make a statement here that we've, we were, I knew we were going to have to talk about. And that is, can we tell what parts are written by Philip K. Dick and what parts are written by Roger Zelazny? I feel like there's parts that I definitely can. But it's strange because Zelazny's prose is stunningly incredible. And so are Philip K. Dick's, especially when Philip K. Dick is talking about hallucinogenic ideas. Um, so I really believe that the earlier Pete, the Pete that was, was a shaman, that was taking drugs to find God, was Philip K. Dick's Pete. I feel like the Pete we get in this section 
is the Roger Zelazny Peat. And in this case, I feel like the Roger Zelazny Peat is not as good as the Philip K. Dick Peat. Um, although it's funny, I found one other review of this novel on YouTube. If you just if you do a search, you can find it. Um, and that writer swears that this part is Philip K. Dick and that it's the best part of the novel. So this is obviously fallible. Trying to decide what's Dick and what's Zelazny is fallible. Um, I know for a fact that we can't just say the first part was written by Dick and then he gave the manuscript away because he felt like it was failing and the second part was written by Zelazny. That is not the case. They went back to the first part. Zelazny added stuff into the first part. They are truly collaborating on this. It's not one guy started it, one guy finished. They are collaborating through, and that is important. Dick writes great humor. Anybody that's read the book Ubik, this is a first book club edition of Ubik, hard to come by. Um, anybody that's read Ubik and watched the narrator struggle with trying to get out of his apartment if he doesn't pay a nickel, you know that, that Dick can be kind of a comedic genius at times. Um, Zelazny also can be funny. There's an, there's an addition in this section of humor. He meets the, the same sentient bugs that uh, Tiber met. I'm jumping ahead a little bit. And they're rolling around big old piles of poop. And there's all kinds of descriptions of them adding poop to the balls they're rolling around. And poop splattering on poor Pete, and it's all very funny. Um, and I mean it, it's written well, it's funny. And the bugs talk about this god they worship that's on the top of this hill, but is falling apart, and Pete says, oh, I'd like to meet this, this god. Um, and they say, no, you'll steal it if you meet it. And he's like, okay. And as, as he's walking away, they say um, V-E-E, -E, double, D-O-U-B-L-E, uh, you, Y-O-U, bless you, V-W, bless you, and you realize these bugs are worshipping a Volkswagen bug. It's punny. It's very funny. Um, and it could easily be Zelazny. There's puns like, like this throughout uh, the Dream Master. And I do think it's Zelazny, although the, the other YouTuber would, would say that this is Dick. But I feel like we've lost the thread of the seriousness of the drug-taking shaman and what religion means. And we've lost the kind of trippy, intense Alice in Wonderland um, for comedy that that doesn't fit that wasn't needed it doesn't fit and it's not bad comedy it's just unneeded comedy uh this book wasn't making me laugh it was making me think and then suddenly i'm just giggling and and all the gravitas that has been created is lost i feel i really do um but that sounds like oh my god the novel's bad no it is not what i'm talking about is like probably this much of the book, like tiny. It is not huge. This book still got a 9 out of 10 because it was incredible. Uh, it's just this part sagged a little for me. It wasn't perfect. But there is stuff that we did need to learn, even though it felt repetitive as it uh, went through. Remember the AI computer that Tiber ran into? Well, of course, Pete runs into that as well. One of these blank robots with the holograph of a woman over it, and the computer only has a, a small amount of these, comes out and grabs Pete. They've already, they already lost one of their robots, right? The AI did because of Tiber earlier, so they're not screwing around anymore. So they're dragging Tiber straight to the acid tank, to the main computer, and uh, saying, you know, ask your questions, ask whatever questions you want. And Pete's trying to stall for time and freaking out. And all of a sudden, a bounty hunter is what Pete calls him. A hunter uh, walks up behind the robot and starts unscrewing a bolt in the back of the robot's head and says, hey, if I unscrew this all the way, you will lose this blank robot. 
Do you want to lose two robots in one day? And the computer ignores it, but as he's about to unscrew it all the way, the computer finally lets go of Pete, because it obviously is afraid of losing another unit. But it turns around and punches the hunter. And the hunter has this metal helmet on, um, and punches the hunter, and the hunter falls down, and suddenly a puddle of blood come, starts coming out where the face was. Um and Pete is shocked, and in a moment of kind of moral failing, he yells at the computer, take him instead of me. And the computer and him converse for a second about hunters. Um, and the computer says, this hunter is after the same person you are, Tiber. Um, in fact, all the hunters are, and I think the computer is referring to this bounty hunter and Pete. I think the computer thinks of Pete also as a hunter. Um, and so Pete's wondering why the hunter is after Tiber, but he's so afraid of being re-grabbed, he runs. And and he the last thing he sees is the computer dragging this hunter to the uh, acid vat. And again, he goes, he meets the lizards, he meets the bugs, uh, we get the humor... And after all this, he's on Tiber's trail. It's, it's, it's dark out. The sun has set. And he's about to, to follow Tiber up to the port, part where his wheel came off and be able to help him. Hopefully, we're hoping. Um, but he sees a campfire. And he walks up to the campfire. And he sees the hunter sitting there. <clears throat> and he's completely confused. And he walks up to the hunter. And the hunter's like, hey, join me. Um, I hate eating alone, the hunter says. Uh, so Pete is famished and starts eating what the hunter has to offer him. Um, and then suddenly Pete starts to feel guilty and is like, boy, I hope he wasn't awake when, he, when I said to the computer, hey, take him instead of me. Uh, that really freaks him out. And then he starts doing mental gymnastics to make himself feel better about what he said. And he's like, well, I thought that he was almost dead, so it wasn't really bad of me to ask the computer to take that sacrifice instead of me. Uh, and he starts talking to the hunter, hoping to find out why the hunter is chasing Tiber. The, un the hunter introduces himself, and his name is Jack Schold. And I don't know if I'm pronouncing his last name right, but apparently it means guilt or guilty in German. And he says that he's after Tiber, because he wants to get to Carlton, the god of wrath. Uh, and he goes into this soliloquy of, of the fact that nobody hurt more people than Carlton. So therefore, of course, there are a lot of people that would love a bounty hunter to catch him and kill him. And he says he works for part of a secret police organization that is out to get him. So his goal is to get to Carlton and kill him, uh, and kill him, uh, torture him a little bit and kill him for the, the best, better of all mankind. And he says, Pete, will you help me? Um, and Pete realizes this is kind of the only way that he can do it. So he agrees to help Jack. Uh, and that's kind of the end of Pete's section. Although, although it is important to say that the rest of the book is from Pete's point of view. It, it might, that's not true, it might go into Tiber's. It's either in Pete's or Tiber's. Now that they come together, which they will in just a second, the rest of the book is, is those two, uh, either one of those two. And that brings us to part five, the last part of this novel that I will call Showdown. So... Jack and Pete go up to Tiber. Tiber needs help. They help him. He's super excited. He's not going to die. That's great. Uh, and they decide to travel together because Jack tells him that he has heard that there is a man uh, that everybody thinks is Carlton living outside these bunkers and that he has a uh, daughter that's mentally handicapped. And they're like, that's fantastic. So he says, yeah, I'll take you right to him. And Jack pulls, I mean, Pete pulls Jack aside and says, hey, 
Jack, is there any way that we could not have Carlton, I mean, not have Tiber see Carlton? Because Pete realizes that he's probably on a mission for the Christian church to not have Tiber get such a big win for the Servants of Wrath, right? This will bring so many more followers to the Servants of Wrath if he's able to paint this accurate mural. And Jack agrees, okay, we'll just pretend that... Uh, that it's not Carlton and you guys will move on with your, with your pilg and I'll go and do what I need to do to Carlton. And that's great. Um, and Jack says, I'm going to make Tiber trust me. Uh, I'm going to play on his ego. Don't worry. He'll trust me. If you could disappear for a while tonight, that'd be great. So, uh, Pete takes a walk after dinner. So it's just Tiber and Jack. Uh, although Pete really is going to call father Abernathy. Doesn't matter. Um, over the fire, they sit and talk, Tiber and Jack, and Jack reveals that he is actually the head of the church of the Servants of Wrath. And he explains to Tiber that Charlottesville exists solely for Tiber. Because Tiber needs to paint this mural. And everything has been pushing towards Tiber painting this mural. And Tiber's pride explodes. Um, he feels like the center of the world. Of course, the guy's literally saying that, that the town where he grew up was created specifically for him. All coming to the moment of painting this mural. And he's meeting the head, head, head of his church, and that's super exciting to him. So he starts making fun of uh, Christianity, and Pete and him fight a little bit. Um, and Pete's like, screw this, i got to go to the bathroom. And he goes to the bathroom. And um, when he comes back, Jack joins in with Tiber, and they're making fun of Christianity again, and Pete's pissed. And finally Jack's laughing and says, i got to go to the bathroom. And Jack goes to the bathroom, and... So the dog's name is Toby. I'm going to bring up the dog again. Um, also, if you haven't read the book, this is when the big twist spoiler is about to come out. So um, you might have already guessed. Who knows? Um, the dog has never really cared for um, Jack. Whenever Jack comes around, the dog growls. And earlier, Jack kicked the dog because it was growling and bothering him. So Jack goes off to pee. And suddenly there's a large whelp, um, and Tiber freaks out and rolls his cart through the bushes where Jack went to pee, um, and all Pete hears is, you killed him, you son of a bitch. So Pete jumps up and runs, and he gets there just in time to see Tiber using his bionic arms to beat the hell out of Jack just laying into this this bounty hunter um well I guess the head of the uh, the church and he's yelling him you killed him you son of a bitch and he's beating him up um and he hits him and knocks his helmet off and at that point Pete realizes that he is Carlton he is the god of wrath the hunter that was after Tiber, was the god of wrath the whole time. He's left Alice and is um, just back at home. He hasn't like left her permanently. He's left her back at home, and he's making sure that Tiber's going through with this pilgrimage. Um, and at this point, Pete realizes him, realizes that Carlton's plan was that he was going to force Pete to kill him, to kill Carlton, so that... Tiber could witness the martyring of the God of Wrath and paint it in to the mural, which would secure the future of the God of Wrath of religion forever. And he ends up, Tiber does, lifting up Carlton by the neck and choking him to death with his bionic arms and the carts leaned forward because the bionic arms are holding him up off the ground um, and Pete says that um, Carlton dies in like a dance of death um, pose this all happens so fast and it 
turns the novel on its head because everything you're expecting was more pilgrimage that you were going to get to meet finally uh, Carlton. This comes out of nowhere. This blindsided me. This is Carlton. Wow. Um, Tiber just killed the whole reason for his pilgrimage. Wow. And we realize at this point, and I think this is the, the heart of the book for me. This is the main theme, in my opinion. We realize that everything about the religion has probably been controlled by Carlton. I believe, I believe that what he said to Tiber was true. That he is the head of the sowers, the servants of wrath. I think that once people started worshiping him, he started building into this and he felt the God inside him. And this is important. We have to remember in my interpretation of this, when they started worshiping this concept, it became real. So he felt the duality of this young God inside of him and he wanted to secure the future of this religion. And I think that the town of Charlottesville was made for Tiber and for the, the, the mural. And I think I'll, I'll go even farther. One of the things I could never explain was the technology of the cart. I believe that Carlton has been raising Tiber to be exactly what he needed Tiber to be from the beginning. I think that that cart was made by Carlton, and that would make perfect sense. He created the AI. He knows tech before the uh, um, apocalypse. He could have given that cart to Tiber through the church, right? Everything, every step of it is put together by Carlton, and this is in my opinion, what makes this ending so great. One small act of wrath by the God of wrath destroys 20 years of planning, right? He did the most God of wrath thing possible. He killed that dog. That dog was bugging him. He killed it. He's the God of wrath. Makes perfect sense. But the love inside Tiber, the goodness inside Tiber, couldn't handle that, that loss at all. So he unknowingly killed the God of Wrath. The whole reason he was out there, everything he was looking for, he killed it. This small coincidental moment stopped all plans. Um, and the martyrdom of Carlton didn't occur. So they go on with their pilg. Um, Pete cannot bring himself to tell Tiber that he just killed the God of Wrath. Tiber has no idea. They tool around and they both get depressed thinking this is going to go on forever. Like weeks and weeks they go on this uh, pilg and it's awful and they are starting to hate it. One night it's raining um, and they go into a barn and in this barn, they, they realize there's another person. There's a drunk passed out in the other stall. Um, so Pete goes to see if he's okay. And he suddenly realizes that he has a chance to end the pilgrimage. And he quietly tells this drunk, hey, pretend you're this person, this Carlton, this God of wrath. Tell my friend that you're, you're this God of wrath. And he pays him off. And the a drunk, I think it's old drunk Tom is his name, tells... Tiber that he's the god of wrath and Tiber believes him and takes a picture and that's the end of the pilgrimage and they go home and Tiber paints the mural of uh, of Carlton. Now an interesting thing happened right when Tiber killed the god of wrath and that is soon after Alice is sitting outside the bunker confused as to what's happening with her father and these lizard people come that apparently deliver bodies to where they're supposed to be. I don't know. Um, very confusing, but suddenly she sees her father floating down the road in light 
and he stops and lifts the veil off of her mind, basically curing her of her mental disability, um, and then dissipates into lights. And again, there's such a complexity here because Carlton was a bad man, the, the destroyer of humanity. And still, um, Dick and Zelazny give him great empathy. He becomes a savior in a very Christ-like way. Uh, and I found that very interesting. Uh, also, Father Abernathy is back in Charlottesville, and he can feel something evil truly die out of the world. And he has a vision that Charlottesville is the Garden of Eden. And it seems to him that that they've entered a new era. Um, and he, of course, associates it with Christianity, but I think Dick and Zelazny are also associating it with the God of Wrath, that the God of Wrath... And if you, if you look at it, I'm getting close to my conclusion here. Um, in fact, I think I am there. Um, yeah. So in conclusion, I think that Dick and Zelazny are pointing towards the concept that the God of Wrath was born dur out, of a, out of an evil man during an evil time. And in a post-apocalyptic world, you need a new religion, right? Because the, the, the way religions form depend on the environment people live in. Uh, for instance, desert gods have a tendency to be angry gods, whereas um, tropical or forest gods are, are more benign, and, and so on and so forth. We see this uh, in, in anthropology a lot. Um, so they're in this post-apocalyptic wasteland. Of course, they're going to need a new god. And the god of wrath, Deus Ire, is born from that. But slowly, humanity's rebuilding small cities or small towns, bringing their, their society back together, and life is getting better. So somehow the God of Wrath needs to change to exist. And the way he was going to change was his martyrdom. And although his martyrdom didn't happen, the, uh, Tiber still painted the mural. Uh, and this is very important to the religion. In fact, we flash forward and Tiber's an old man and almost dead and questioning the veracity of the image in the mural has become illegal in the society. So servants of wrath still exist. They have enough control over society that they can make it illegal for people to question them. And Tiber is living very well off of a pension from the church. Um, pretty well, we'll say, actually. Not very well. They give him a small pension. And he is considered the greatest artist since the Renaissance because of that painting. And the book ends with there being a diary, Tiber's diary. And in the diary, Tiber, as he aged, began to question whether or not the person in the mural was actually the god of wrath. But the church secrets that away and either locks it in a vault or destroys it. Um, but we see that the church is changing the temperament of the god of wrath. And that is, to me, a mirror image of Christianity in the Old Testament to the New Testament. And I think all of this God of Wrath stuff is meant as an analogy of Jesus and God in Old Testament, right? Um, because that religion formed way back then. And this religion is forming now, but they're, they, they run a parallel course. And that's one of the things that make this novel so interesting. Yeah, so that's my interpretation of the book. If you have a different interpretation, please share it in the comments. I love to read that kind of stuff. If you watch this video to the end, <laughs> if you watch this video to the end and it's a long one, I really appreciate it. I love making these. I like getting this deep with stuff. It's really enjoyable for me. 
Um, and if you like this video, please click like. And if you like this kind of content, of course, we're going to be doing a lot more like it. So click subscribe. Sorry this was so long in the coming. I had to re-record it. I think this version is a lot better, makes a lot more sense. So, all right, we'll see you in the future.